The Olmecs are largely presented as being the mother culture of Mesoamerica. The settlement story of the Americas is much more complicated uh, than we've, you know, than we than we've realized. And and what the what the DNA is doing is uh, it's telling us that there was something really weird, weird. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there was a growing fascination with ancient civilizations, particularly in the Victorian era. This interest was driven by a mix of cultural trends in exploration, colonization, and a certain romantic allure attached to discovering lost cultures. Major institutions like museums and universities, primarily in Europe and the US, started funding expeditions to unearth ancient artifacts and understand the history of indigenous civilizations in the Americas. It was a time when archaeology began to evolve from just hunting for treasures to a more scientific approach, focusing on careful excavation and detailed analysis. One of the things I've realized is that there is no classic Native American feature, that, that Na Native Americans are, uh, a very, have a very complex genetic story with very many different elements uh, br brought into it, and we shouldn't be necessarily surprised by the supposedly non-Native American look. Interestingly, during this period, many artifacts, especially the colossal heads and stone structures found in the Olmec region, were often wrongly attributed to other well-known civilizations like the Maya or Aztec. This was largely because the unique aspects of Olmec art and iconography weren't immediately recognized, partly due to a lack of an overall framework to understand the region's history before Columbus. A couple of notable explorers, John Lloyd Stevens and Frederick Catherwood, played a significant role in stirring up interest in Mesoamerican cultures with their explorations and writings, particularly their books on travels in Central America and Yucatan. Their detailed accounts and illustrations captured the public's imagination, sparking a wave of interest in these ancient cultures. While they mainly focused on the Maya, their approach to systematically document their findings and blend travel narratives with scholarly observations greatly influenced future archaeologists studying Mesoamerica. Uh, it's been known by archaeologists for quite a long time that there are anomalous skulls uh, in parts of Brazil, uh, which appear to show uh, very strongly Polynesian or African features, very much like the features that we see mm. on, the, on the Olmec heads. Around this time, there was also a trend in comparative archaeology, where discoveries from different parts of the world were compared, helping to place Mesoamerican civilizations in a global context. Museums began to transition from just storing artifacts to becoming centers of research and education, playing a crucial role in spreading knowledge about ancient cultures. This era also marked the start of interdisciplinary approaches in archaeology, integrating fields like anthropology, linguistics, and early forms of environmental science. This broader, more inclusive approach helped in piecing together a more comprehensive understanding of ancient civilizations, including the intriguing and complex Olmec culture. Back in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, when Western archaeologists were exploring Mesoamerica, they started coming across these massive stone heads. Some of them were over nine feet tall and weighed several tons, with distinctive features like flat noses and fleshy cheeks, often adorned with helmet-like headgear. But here's the thing. Despite their impressive size and unique features, their true cultural significance wasn't immediately understood they're most famous for is these huge carved human heads uh, which can be on a scale of up to 20 to 25 tons which have curious features which have been interpreted variously as Polynesian, African, don't look like classic uh, Native American features. One of the earliest significant findings was made by Jose Melgari Serrano in 1862 at Tres Zapotes in Veracruz. He unearthed what we now know as one of the first Olmec colossal heads. Melgari Serrano even described the head as having Ethiopian features, which tells us a lot about the perceptions and biases of that era. But, and this is crucial, his discovery didn't really spark a broader understanding of the Olmec culture right away. For a long time, these heads were seen more as intriguing oddities rather than pieces of a larger cultural puzzle. It took several decades and a lot more digging before the significance of these heads truly began to be appreciated. Initially, many people thought these artifacts might belong to other known civilizations, like the Maya or Aztec. 
because the idea of the Olmecs being a distinct early Mesoamerican civilization hadn't quite taken shape yet. It wasn't until the mid-20th century, with more systematic excavations led by archaeologists like Matthew Sterling, that the true picture began to emerge. They found more colossal heads and other artifacts, and this really helped to establish the Olmecs as a significant and influential civilization in their own right, predating and possibly even influencing others like the Maya and the Aztecs. Back in 1945, a really important expedition took place, led by this guy named Matthew Sterling. He and his team headed to San Lorenzo, right in the heart of what was once Olmec territory. This wasn't just any random adventure, it was a big deal because the Smithsonian Institution was backing it. They saw the potential in figuring out more about the Olmec sites, which could really shed some light on Mesoamerican prehistory. Before Sterling got there, there had been some poking around in the area, mostly because people kept finding these huge stone heads. These finds were intriguing but didn't quite give the full picture. So enter Sterling. He was already pretty well known in archaeology circles and had a real knack for Mesoamerican cultures. He was the perfect guy to take on such a complex task. Now, it wasn't an easy job. The San Lorenzo site was in this tropical area, covered in thick jungle. Just getting to the site and starting to dig was a huge challenge. They had to clear a bunch of jungle without messing up any artifacts that might be hiding there. And let me tell you, the weather didn't make things any easier. It was humid, unpredictable and not the best for keeping ancient artifacts in one piece. The site itself was huge, spreading out over several kilometers. Sterling and his team had to figure out where to start digging because there was no way they could cover the whole area. They did an initial survey which took a lot of time and planning and then decided on the most promising spots to start excavating. They had to be super careful with how they dug things up. The artifacts were old and fragile, especially with the humidity. Plus, they had to keep track of everything they found, where they found it, and all the details, which was crucial for understanding the site later on. It wasn't something the Maya made up. The Olmecs used that same symbolism. So the Mayan calendar is actually an Olmec calendar. What they found at San Lorenzo was amazing. It turned out to be one of the oldest big cities in Mesoamerica, dating way back to around 1200 to 900 BCE. That's even before civilizations like the Maya and Aztecs that most people are familiar with. The artifacts they unearthed, especially those massive stone heads, were a big deal. They were carved from single blocks of basalt and had all these unique facial features. It was clear that the people who made them were incredibly skilled, all this hard work at San Lorenzo really helped piece together the story of the Olmecs. It gave us a clearer timeline and showed just how complex and advanced their society was. Diving deeper into San Lorenzo, which is super important when it comes to understanding the Olmec civilization, it's considered the oldest major city in Mesoamerica, dating back to around 1200 to 900 BCE. That's way before other famous civilizations like the Maya and Aztecs. Radiocarbon dating was key here, it helped archaeologists nail down the timeline of the site, giving a much clearer picture of when the Olmecs were doing their thing. Now, the most famous stuff they found at San Lorenzo. Definitely the colossal heads. These huge sculptures were carved from single basalt blocks and are known for their unique facial features like almond-shaped eyes and broad noses. A lot of them have these intricate headdresses too, which might have been a sign of high status or had some ceremonial purpose but there's still a lot of debate about what all the symbols mean. The size of these heads is just mind-blowing. Some are up to three meters high and weigh around 50 tons. Imagine the skill it took to carve those. But it wasn't just the heads. They found jade figurines and a bunch of different pottery styles, which tell us a lot about their daily life, art, and even trade. The jade stuff suggests they had trade networks because jade wasn't just lying around everywhere. And the buildings. They found large structures like platforms and what might have been houses for the elite. This points to a society that was really well organized and had the resources to build big. The way San Lorenzo was laid out is also fascinating. It had a central axis which indicates that the city was carefully planned. There were separate areas for ceremonies and living showing a sophisticated urban structure and hinting at a social hierarchy. All this stuff from San Lorenzo has been super important for understanding the Olmecs. It's given us a much clearer timeline of their civilization and shown just how complex their society was. The variety in the artifacts from the colossal heads to the pottery shows that they were not only skilled in stone carving, but had artists and craftsmen who were really good at what they did. 
It's like San Lorenzo has given us a window into a past world, showing us how these ancient people lived, worked, and created. After the exciting discoveries at San Lorenzo in the 1940s, archaeologists turned their attention to La Venta, another key Olmec site in Tabasco, Mexico, in the 1950s. This shift was a big deal because La Venta offered a new window into the Olmec world. Known as one of the earliest complex societies in Mesoamerica, the explorations here were more focused and methodical, thanks to archaeologists like Philip Drucker and Robert Heiser. These guys weren't just digging around, they brought in techniques from other fields like anthropology and geology, giving a fuller picture of the Olmec civilization. La Venta is super important for understanding the peak of Olmec culture. The site was in its prime from around 900 to 400 BCE, a time when the Olmecs were really showing off their artistic and architectural skills. One of the standout features of Leventa is the Great Pyramid. It's not like the pyramids in Egypt, this one's made of earth and clay and has a unique conical shape. It was one of the biggest structures in ancient Mesoamerica at the time, which tells us the Olmecs were pretty good at organizing big construction projects. The pyramid was probably more than just a big building, it's believed to have been a key spot for ceremonies or religious activities, kind of like the heart of Olmec ritual life. The way they built it and other structures at Leventa, and how they aligned them with astronomical bodies shows they were pretty savvy with engineering and astronomy. It was likely a bustling cultural hub where significant ceremonies and gatherings happened. When archaeologists started digging at Leventa, they did things a bit differently than before. They were super systematic about it, focusing on layers of soil and the context of each artifact they found. But they had their work cut out for them. The tropical climate and the fact that many Olmec structures were made of earth really made preserving and understanding these finds tough. They had to be meticulous in recording everything they dug up, which has been a goldmine for future analysis. Now just like at San Lorenzo, La Venta is famous for its massive basalt heads. Carved from huge boulders, these heads are thought to be representations of Olmec rulers or other big shots in their society. But there's more. The site is full of altars with intricate carvings showing people, animals and all sorts of symbolic scenes. It's like getting a glimpse into their mythology and rituals. And then there's the jade. Leventa turned up loads of jade artifacts from beautifully carved figurines to Celts. These weren't just pretty things to look at. They showed how skilled the Olmecs were and hinted at long trade networks since jade wasn't just lying around nearby. But here's where it gets really interesting. The burial sites they found were complex, with all kinds of elaborate practices. They also found mosaic pavements made of serpentine and various offerings, which likely had deep religious meaning. All this stuff from Leventa has been super important in piecing together who the Olmecs were, their social structure, religious beliefs, and artistic talents. However, keeping Leventa in good shape for future studies is a challenge, the sites battling both natural elements and human factors. So, preserving this amazing place is crucial, not just for archaeology buffs, but for understanding a key part of human history. But what's fascinating about them is they are, they are supposedly the first high civilization of Central America. That they create structures on a massive scale, that you can see connections between them and the later, the later Maya. For the Maya, the Milky Way was a particularly important feature of the heavens. They conceived of it as the road that led to their netherworld, Zibalba. In the verdant lands of Central America, the ancient Maya civilization flourished with a mysterious brilliance that continues to captivate the world. Among the many enigmas they left behind, their profound understanding of astronomy stands as a testament to their intellectual prowess. Graham Hancock, a modern explorer of ancient mysteries, delves deep into this aspect of the Maya, proposing intriguing theories that stretch the bounds of conventional history. That whole mystery of the Mayan calendar was clearly inherited from the Olmecs. It wasn't something the Maya made up. The Olmecs used that same symbolism. So the Mayan calendar is actually an Olmec calendar. The Maya long count calendar, a marvel of ancient engineering, intricately tracked a 5,125 year cycle with astonishing precision. This calendar wasn't just a tool for marking time. It was a complex understanding of celestial cycles intertwining the Maya's daily lives with the cosmos. Hancock suggests that this precision hints at a deeper, possibly inherited, knowledge of astronomy. Was this sophisticated understanding a legacy from a much older, now lost civilization? 
When one looks at the grandeur of Maya structures such as the pyramid at Chichen Itza, the brilliance of their astronomical alignment is striking. During the equinoxes, the play of light and shadow on this pyramid creates the illusion of a serpent slithering down its steps. To Hancock, these architectural marvels are not just buildings, but celestial maps, echoing an advanced understanding of the cosmos. Orion was extensively involved in Mayan rebirth beliefs, which described the constellation and specifically its three belt stars as the turtle of rebirth. In Egypt, as amongst the Maya, the stellar context involves Orion and the Milky Way. The Maya's awareness of the ecliptic, the path followed by the sun, moon, and planets across the sky, further fuels Hancock's theories. Their ability to predict solar and lunar eclipses and track the movements of Venus, which they revered as the god Kukulkan, showcases their deep astronomical knowledge. Did they learn this from an older civilization? Hancock wonders. A civilization lost in the depths of time. Hancock theorizes that the Maya might have been part of a vast network of ancient civilizations, sharing knowledge across seas and continents. This global maritime culture, as he envisages, could have been a conduit for transferring advanced astronomical and architectural knowledge to the Maya. The architectural designs of the Maya, seen in their pyramids, temples, and cities, reflect a level of technological and engineering skill that seems almost ahead of their time. Were these skills handed down from a previous, more advanced civilization? The mathematical systems of the Maya, including their use of zero, a concept rare in the ancient world, were integral to their astronomical calculations. Hancock proposes that this mathematical sophistication, too, might be a legacy from a forgotten civilization. We're not what it's all about at all. Uh, that there may have been an earlier civilization that reached a high level of advancement, perhaps different from ours, but nevertheless an advanced civilization, which was just taken out of the story completely by a global cataclysm. In a tale woven from the threads of ancient mysteries, Graham Hancock, a modern-day seeker of lost truths, presents a fascinating theory. He imagines a world where an advanced civilization, predating the ancient cultures known to history, once thrived. This civilization, possibly flourishing before the last ice age ended around 10,000 BCE, was a beacon of knowledge in fields like astronomy, architecture, and mathematics. Hancock's story tells of a society whose influence stretched far beyond its own time and space, touching various corners of the ancient world, including the enigmatic Maya civilization. I think, and it's my case, that it wiped our memory of a previous episode of, of human civilization, that right at the epicenter of this cataclysm was a civilization that we would regard as advanced, not a simple hunter-gatherer civilization, which was utterly wiped out uh, in this cataclysmic event. However, this ancient global society in Hancock's story faced a dramatic and catastrophic end. He hypothesizes that a cataclysmic event, such as a comet impact or a massive flood, nearly obliterated this civilization. But not all was lost. The survivors, carrying the torch of their advanced knowledge, ventured out into the world. These bearers of ancient wisdom found their way to other, less advanced societies and shared their knowledge, planting the seeds for new civilizations to grow. Among these were the Maya, who, in Hancock's view, may have been one of the many inheritors of this ancient legacy. Hancock points to the Maya's remarkable architectural and astronomical achievements as evidence of this influence. The precision of their calendar systems, their understanding of celestial cycles, and the alignment of their buildings with astronomical events are, in his narrative, not just the fruits of their own ingenuity, but possibly a heritage from a civilization lost in the mists of time. He draws parallels between the architectural styles, religious beliefs, and astronomical knowledge found across various ancient cultures, suggesting these similarities might be remnants of a shared source of ancient wisdom. Because we now know that at that time, between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, truly global cataclysmic events involving rapid rises in sea level yeah. uh, did occur, and suddenly the, the worldwide tradition of a, of a global flood stops being just a myth and starts being a memory. In a narrative that intertwines the mysteries of ancient seas with the Maya calendar, Graham Hancock, a storyteller of history's hidden chapters, brings to life his theories of a bygone era. He paints a picture of an ancient world, 
not fragmented by vast oceans, but connected through them. This world, according to Hancock, was home to a sophisticated global maritime culture. This culture, adept in the art of navigation and shipbuilding, embarked on extensive sea voyages, knitting together the far-flung civilizations of the ancient world. Hancock's tale is not just about the movement of ships, but also about the flow of ideas, technologies, and beliefs. He sees the similarities in architectural styles and construction techniques across different ancient cultures as whispers of a shared knowledge, possibly disseminated through this maritime network. In this story, ancient seafarers are the unsung heroes, ferrying not just goods, but also the seeds of culture and religion across the world's watery expanse. He draws parallels with the Polynesian navigators, known for their remarkable oceanic voyages, suggesting that similar capabilities could have existed among these ancient maritime cultures. They're telling us that uh, this lost civilization was submerged in a great flood around 11,600 years before our time. This is why I think we need to pay attention to the Atlantis story rather than just write it off as the ravings of the lunatic fringe. But Hancock's narrative takes an intriguing turn as he touches upon the mysterious Maya civilization and their long count calendar. This calendar, a sophisticated timekeeping system, tracks a cycle of approximately 5,125 years, culminating in a date that modern calendars align with December 21st, 2012. Hancock, weaving a tale from the threads of time, views this not as an apocalyptic end, but as a significant moment in Maya cosmology, a marker of major transition or transformation. In this story, the 2012 phenomenon is not a tale of doom, but a moment of cosmological significance, possibly indicating a shift in human consciousness or the dawn of a new era in human history. Hancock uses this moment to discuss the broader concept of historical cycles, how ancient civilizations understood and measured time, and their alignment with astronomical events such as the precession of the equinoxes and the galaxy's alignment. Graham Hancock, a modern-day chronicler of lost civilizations, presents a captivating theory. He tells a story of Earth's history punctuated by cataclysmic events, asteroid impacts, massive floods, and volcanic eruptions that have periodically reshaped the course of human civilization. In this tale, these cataclysms are not just natural disasters, but pivotal moments that lead to the rise and fall of civilizations, causing a reset of human progress.